Uh, so my name is uh, Senthil Tudadri. I'm going to be talking about uh, continuous quantum mode uh, phase transitions. Uh, the slightly different flavor, actually very different flavor from blood uh, and related uh, phenomena. Uh, so the work is uh, uh, reported in many of these papers over the last few years. Let uh, me highlight some of my collaborators, uh, William Vichak Kremper, uh, who's now a postdoc at Perimeter, uh, Puyan Gaemi, a former student of mine, is uh, on the faculty at CUNY New York, uh, Yongbek Kim, and uh, uh, myself. Uh, okay. Uh, I guess I don't quite know how to work this. No, I can't move anything. <laughs> What's going on? Okay. Uh, uh, so a common phase diagram in many of these uh, correlated systems is, uh, uh, what's going on? Ah, okay. Uh, it's something like this, uh, uh, where as you tune some parameter, uh, for instance, pressure or magnetic fields or doping, uh, you go from a certain phase, uh, which I'll call phase A, to a certain other phase, phase B, through some intermediate phase, which occupies a narrow region of the phase diagram. But it, uh, as you go above this intermediate phase, you get a metal which doesn't at all look like a Fermi liquid. And this is actually very common. Uh, uh, the best example, perhaps, is in the cuprates. Uh, 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 Nigel gave a wonderful overview of some of the, uh, uh, you know, the, of a, of the transport experiments in the cuprates, but the cuprate phase diagram evolving continuously with time. Uh, at, at, as of uh, right now, it looks something like this. Uh, there's a famous superconductor, of course. Uh, as Nigel said, there's a new kid on the block, which is this uh, so-called charge order. Uh, there's the equally famous pseudo-gap uh, state, uh, uh, and the pseudo-gap temperature seems to come down and uh, disappear at some critical doping. Uh, now, the hero of the story, at least as far as this conference goes, is this region, which is sometimes called the Sange metal. And I think, you know, uh, we've heard a lot of talk about bad metals. Uh, uh, in the cuprate context, it's often called the strange metal. I think there's a, it's good to keep in mind that the cuprate strange metal is more than just being bad. It's a bad strange metal. Right? And one of the, in, Weird features about the cuprate strange metal is that bad as it is, the badness continues all the way to very, very low temperature if you suppress the superconductivity and push it down. In particular, around this doping, uh, the, the weird aspects of the strange metal behavior at high temperature continue without modification down to very, very low temperature. Okay? So we can't just make a high temperature theory of what's going on in the cuprates because the same phenomenology goes down to very low temperature, okay? Uh, okay, so uh, the stained metal is perhaps the most mysterious aspect of cuprate physics, uh, uh, you know, something that we really have to understand before we can declare victory in the cuprates. Uh, so there's a lot of ideas over the years. Uh, uh, so one idea that uh, 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 has been very popular is that stain metal behavior is plausibly linked to quantum criticality. Okay, so, uh, so there's a lot that's been said experimentally and theoretically about this idea, but I want to highlight a couple of new, uh, actually not so new, but uh, 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 relatively new developments. Uh, so there's increasing evidence in the last decade or so for a quantum critical point around this magical doping of 19% in the underlying normal state uh, electronic structure of the cuprates. Uh, uh, it goes back to early work by Talon and Lorem, pointing out uh, by analyzing a lot, uh, wide variety of experiments that the pseudo-gap crossover, uh, if you extrapolate it down to zero uh, temperature, that, uh, that crossover scale goes to zero at around this magical doping of 19%. Now, zooming ahead to the most recent uh, work, uh, this charge order that's shown up in the last few years in the cuprate phase diagram also seems to onset at zero temperature at the same magical doping. 
Okay? So it, it appears as though uh, this old observation, which pinpointed uh, this doping as the essential place where the pseudogap phenomenon first starts up, is also the essential place where this new phenomenon of charge order first rears its head as you decrease the doping from the overdope side. So going to the future even further, uh, go, I mean, uh, going forward in time, uh, just this uh, earlier this year, there's a paper in Science by uh, Ramshaw and S Sebastian and so on, uh, studying quantum oscillations in underdope cuprate YBCO at very, very high fields, 90 Tesla fields. And uh, they seem to find an enhancement of the quasi-particle effective mass in these underdoped samples at very, very low temperature and high fields as you in increase the doping and approach optimal doping. And based on extrapolation of their data, they also suggest that uh, uh, this mass enhancement diverges as you approach optimal doping. Uh, and the, the po most importantly, the point where it diverges corresponds precisely to this magical doping of 0.18, more or less 0.19. Uh, and they suggested that there's a quantum critical point as well, around 19%. So, you know, each one of these uh, different sets of observations are completely different kinds of experiments, but they all seem to point towards something very fundamental happening at 19%, where, uh, 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 and, uh, uh, where there's a dramatic change in the ground state of your system. Okay. Uh, so the big question that's raised by all of these things uh, uh, is the following, right? So how do the pseudo gap and charge order onset as the doping is decreased from optimal doping, uh, from, from the overdoped side? So deep in the overdoped side, neither of these phenomena exist. There's no pseudo gap and there's no charge order. As you decrease the doping, both these phenomena uh, 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 are empirically well documented. So then what happens? Uh, so I want to make a couple of comments uh, here. Uh, the first is that the onset of the pseudo gap, uh, as you decrease the temperature, there's a lot of debate on whether it's a phase transition or a crossover. Right? It's, uh, for, for the longest time, people have believed that it's a crossover, but then in the last two years, uh, there have been some hints that maybe it's actually a phase transition. Uh, but that issue, issue is somewhat moot at zero temperature, where at zero temperature, it's clear that the onset of the pseudo gap is necessarily a sharp phase transition because you're changing the electronic structure of your system. And as we know from many, many examples, changes of electronic structure, you know, if you gap out some portions of your Fermi surface, that's a bona fide phase transition. It, it doesn't require any order parameter or anything like that. So at zero temperature, the onset of pseudo gap is, has to occur through a quantum phase transition. And furthermore, again at zero temperature, if we extrapolate the finite temperature pseudo gap state down to zero temperature, if we do have a pseudo, uh, this uh, zero temperature pseudo gap state, and if it does not have any broken translation symmetry, that's necessarily an exotic ground state. It's a non Fermi liquid state because by Leringer's theorem, the usual Fermi liquid, which is the only, you know, any ordinary Fermi liquid has to satisfy Leringer, and it can't sustain gaps in some portions of the Fermi surface. Right? Of course, in the cube rates, uh, this, uh, empirically, the pseudo gap state. Uh, at finite temperature, uh, as you decrease the temperature, develops charge order, so you do break translation symmetry. But it's important to keep this in mind as we try to think about how, how these two phenomena onset as you decrease the doping. So based on some of these experiments, and uh, I was trying to think about how these two things can actually onset uh, in the context of thinking about the, this experiment by Ramshaw and Sebastian. And I came up with four general possibilities for how, as you decrease the temperature from the overdoped side, uh, you can have an onset of both the pseudo gap and the charge order. Okay? Uh, I plotted this, uh, uh, this vertical axis an energy scale, uh, and the, and the uh, horizontal axis the doping. So there's four general possibilities. First is that the pseudo gap scale can come down and close at XPG, while the charge ordering scale uh, 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 closes only at some X charge order, which is bigger uh, at a higher doping level than the pseudo gap scale. The second possibility is the charge order uh, uh, closes first, and the pseudo gap closes at a different doping, at a higher doping. And the 
Third and fourth possibilities are very similar in that the charge order and Schroeder gap both close at exactly the same doping level, but they perhaps close with different exponents. So which one of these things is going on in the cuprates is a question that we can try to pose and try to sort out through experiments. Okay? Uh, so let's look at this one by one. Uh, so much of the theoretical thinking has implicitly assumed that it's the first one that's going on. Uh, indeed, if you do a hotly fork theory of charge order in the cuprates, this is what you end up with. You start from a Fermi liquid, you int introduce charge order in a hotly forkish sense, you'll get a Fermi liquid plus charge order. As the amplitude of the charge order increases, you'll eventually get a pseudo gap. So this is the conventional scenario, but it's you know, quite unlikely given the current set of experiments that we have. There's no evidence that this pseudo gap line dips below the charge ordering uh, temperature at any doping, right? Uh, uh, empirically, the pseudo gap always seems to be, the charge ordering line is always bounded by the pseudo gap line, right? So even though this is the most conventional scenario, the only one for which we have a good theory of, uh, this, this conventional scenario seems to be very unlikely unless there's some change in the experimental data uh, uh, in, in the future. So let's go to the second one. So this, I would argue, uh, where the charge order closes first and the pseudo gap closes later, is actually extremely exotic because uh, then there's an intermediate range of doping in which the underlying normal state for surface has a pseudo gap but has no broken translation symmetry. And I already pointed out that a pseudo gap metal without broken translation symmetry is an exotic non Fermi liquid state. Right? Uh, at some level, you know, uh, dreamy looking theorists would love this scenario to play itself out. Right? For many years, this, uh, people have hoped there's a non-Fermi liquid ground state in the cuprate phase diagram. Uh, but once again, there's no evidence that this uh, kind of thing is actually happening. Uh, and so even though this is exotic and it'd be wonderful if this scenario were realized, it, based on current data, it seems unlikely that this is what's going on. So we're then left with just these last two possibilities, which are both very similar in that the charge order and pseudo gap both onset at the same point. So this is a conventional ground state. This is just a Fermi liquid. Now, as a ground state, this low temperature state is also conventional. There's no problem with Leringer or anything because now a broken translation symmetry. So it's a Fermi liquid which has charge order, but it also has a pseudo gap. Okay? So neither of these two ground states are non Fermi liquid like, but the transition happens through a single phase transition. Okay? Uh, the difference between these two is too minor for this level of discussion for me to emphasize it. So uh, it seems likely that by process of elimination that this is the only thing, uh, that this may be the scenario that's playing itself out. Yeah. That's right, Which yeah. Is, you know, the transport stop, you don't see it in the yeah, so, so, mm -hmm. right, so, so the, so the overdope side, we can ask to what extent it is a Fermi liquid, right? Uh, and that's a great discussion to have in light of your findings over the years. Uh, so the, so, you know, it's not that much of a bad actor because, it, as you know, it, as you showed, uh, it, it shows nice quantum oscillations with an area that you know, matches the photo emission from its surface beautifully. Uh, as you also know, it shows Wiedemann Franz law that's obeyed to within 1%. Right? Yeah. So it looks like it's a, it's a good boy or a good girl that's occasionally doing that in, in, has one bad feature that there's this small linearity resistivity in the narrow temperature range at low temperature. Right? So I'm willing to overlook that for the time being. Right? Uh, I mean, there are other, it's only mildly mischievous in your language. Everything else is really bad. Yeah. To what extent is it really similar to the condo break? Can't you do where you also have the. Yeah, so, so uh, 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 sure, of course, I'm talking about cuprates. There's no condo effect, really. Uh, but I'm, uh, I'll, I'll mention the heavy fermions in a minute. This is very similar. So, uh, in some sense, we are forced to let. We've been forced to reach a picture which is not that dissimilar to what's probably going on in the heavy Fermi on critical points. Right. Uh, yeah. And empirically, 
uh, uh, you know, as, as I argued, did this seem as though the pseudo gap and charge order do order uh, occurs uh, uh, onset around the same critical doping in, in experiments, right? So we then led to a situation uh, where the Fermi surface has to jump in a rather severe manner as you go from the overdoped normal state Fermi surface to the underdoped normal state Fermi surface through a single direct quantum critical point, okay? Uh, and this quantum critical point is also accompanied by the onset of the broken translation symmetry, which then guarantees that I don't run into problems with Leidinger, okay? So this is, as uh, uh, you already mentioned, this kind of severe jump of the Fermi surface has been suspected in the heavy fermion quantum critical metals for many years. Uh, but that's about all we, that we can say, because no theory of what's going on in the heavy fermion systems as well. Right? So it seems as though both by thinking about cube rates and from the many years of thinking that's gone into heavy electron metals, that we, are, we need to think about a class of problem, a class of quantum criti criticality, whereas the dramatic change of Fermi surface, perhaps also accompanied by uh, the onset of some conventional Landau order parameter, but something more than Landau is clearly going on. There's a change of electronic structure which is not capturable by the Landau order parameter idea, right? Uh, there's very little theoretical understanding of this class of problem, uh, despite you know, many years of work in the heavy electron context, but now perhaps with additional motivation that the same issue is cropping up in the cube rates, uh, perhaps we can go back and uh, try to see if we can make progress on this kind of issue, okay? Unfortunately, I can't report to you any dramatic progress on the most fundamental issue here. But let's step back, right? So uh, can we understand any phase transition where there's a jump of Fermi surface at all? Can a Fermi surface disappear continuously, right? So that's perhaps the most surprising aspect uh, of the phenomenology that comes about from uh, thinking about these systems, okay? Uh, so this question, uh, uh, so part of the reason this problem's been so hard and so vexing is that it's actually a harder version of one of the hardest old problems in the field, namely the, uh, uh, the electronic mode transition. So of course the mode transition, uh, the Fermi surface will change discontinuously, okay? So the mode transition has at least one ingredient in common with the kind of problem that we need to solve in the cube rates and in the heavy fermions. It has a discontinuous change of the Fermi surface. So, so as a warm up towards addressing uh, the, the cube rates of the heavy fermions, we can ask whether we can understand the mode transition, and in particular, is there a possibility of having a continuous zero temperature uh, electronic mode transition where the Fermi surface disappears continuously? Uh, yet, you know, can, can a discontinuous change of Fermi surface happen continuously? Okay, so that's the theoretical question that one would like to come to grips with. Okay, so, this is going to be a real talk in whatever time I have left. Uh, to, uh, I'm going to talk about electronic mode transition and forget about uh, applying it to cube rates or heavy fermions or anything. Uh, you know, it's a hard problem, so we need to solve all kinds of other simpler problems first. And, you know, the mode transition is hardly the kind of simple problem that you just solve in one day, right? Uh, okay, so, uh, so the question is, how does a metal evolve into a mode translator? So the prototypical model that one uses to think about this kind of thing is to think about a one-band Hubbard model at half filling on some non-bipartite lattice, non-bipartite to prevent running into issues with nesting and so on, which I don't want to worry about. So if T over U is large, one is in a Fermi liquid phase uh, with a full Fermi surface that counts, you know, that matches the density of one electron per site. Uh, well, if T over U is small, one will get a mode translator probably antiferromagnetic, and an, and an insulator, of course, doesn't have a Fermi surface. So how do these two states evolve into each other? So that's the question. So wh why has the mode transition been hard all these uh, decades? So first, as Saab uh, already mentioned, there is no order parameter for a metal insulator transition. Right? So standard denormalization theory, uh, to quote Phil Anderson, is uh, more or less irrelevant. Right? I would say that it's dangerously irrelevant. <laughs> <But> <laughs> so on a metallic side, you need to deal with a gapless Fermi surface, 
which is also an ingredient that's not there if you say talking about the icing model. Right? Uh, and there's a complicated interplay between the fundamental phenomenon of the metal insulator transition and the magnetic phase transition that's often there at the mode transition. Right? And to make matters worse, typically in most materials, the most mode transition is first order. But you know, you, you could say that's the end of the story. But it's not quite the end of the story, because at least on frustrated lattices, the transition is sometimes only weakly first order, and fluctuation effects are visible in approaching the mode translator from the metallic side. Right? And this again played a role in uh, Lard's talk. Uh, the critical endpoints, the critical temperatures are very low compared to electronic scales, at least in some situations. Now, in the, in the last decade or so, uh, there's, new, there's a new breath of fresh air into this uh, 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 thinking about the mode transition. Uh, with the advent of a new class of mode translator, uh, known as quantum spin liquids. Uh, uh, Kanoda san is one of the pioneers in this area, experimentally, and he's, he's going to tell us a lot about these quantum, he may tell us a lot about these, he's capable of telling us a lot about quantum spin liquid mode translators. Uh, and these, these are mode translators which have no magnetic ordering, so there's no magnetic order parameter left. Right? Uh, so these provide an opportunity for progress on the mode transition where we can study the metal insulator transition without the complications of the magnetism. Okay? Uh, and by now there's many, many candidate uh, spin liquid materials. Uh, there's these organics that have already been mentioned. There are 3D materials as well. And there's some frustrated uh, 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 Kagome magnets. Uh, now, these first class of materials are different from the second class in that the first class of materials, uh, the spin liquid behavior exists in a molten slater that's actually very close to the metal insulator transition. And they can be driven metallic by the application of pressure, while the second class of materials, uh, uh, they are very, very deep into the molten insulating phase. So let's focus on this class of materials and ask uh, what happens at what whether the mode transition can be second order at, uh, in this class of materials. So some phenomena in experiments is that in all these existing quantum spin liquid materials uh, seem to have gapless uh, excitations down to temperatures much smaller than the magnetic exchange scale. And this most extensively studied in these organic liquids, uh, a, a beautiful example is in, this, in one particular organic uh, spin liquid uh, measuring thermal conductivity at low temperature an important thing to emphasize is that copper over T has a non-zero intercept at low temperature. Uh, so it, uh, exactly as you would expect for a metal, ashcroft merman physics. So it looks like uh, this electrical insulator is actually a very good thermal metal. And it has no magnetic ordering. So it's something or the other is mobile, but it's not electrons that are mobile. Okay. Uh, so this is a plot from uh, uh, Kanoda san's work on uh, uh, this kappa ET material. Uh, I, I think we'll hear a lot more about uh, this kind of phase transition uh, in his talk. But the point is that uh, you take the spin liquid and then you apply pressure, you go into a metal. This temperature scale is very low. It's about 3.5 Kelvin. Uh, so essentially, the transition is between a spin liquid insulator and a metal at low temperature. And this transition is, if anything, only very weakly first order. Right? Or it's not clear, I think, whether the transition is uh, first order or not. So this gives us, us further motivation to seriously consider the question, theoretically, of whether the mode transition is ultimately allowed to be second order. And if so, what happens? OK, so, so what are the theoretical questions? So can the mode transition be continuous? And if so, what's the fate of the electronic Fermi surface? So in the Fermi liquid side, there's a full Fermi surface uh, whose area is fixed by Leidinger, while in the more translating side, there is no Fermi surface. So if the transition is second order, the Fermi surface has to disappear in one shot. Right? There has to be a discontinuous change, jump of the electronic Fermi surface uh, uh, through a continuous phase transition. So this is the ingredient that, this is one of the ingredients that we want to tame if we were to address tube rates or heavy fermions. Okay. So half filling throughout the metallic phase, Leidinger fixes the size of the Fermi surface. But as I already said, uh, in the Morton slater, there's no Fermi surface. 
This means the entire Formisophus must die while maintaining its size. You can't shrink the Formisophus continuously to zero because then you run into problems with Leringer. Okay? So if the mode transition is second order, then the critical point is necessarily very unusual because you have this entire Formisophus that's on the brink of disappearing. Okay? So the entire Formisophus has to go critical and it's natural to expect non fermi liquid physics. I also, as I already said, this is similar to the kinds of phenomena that we want to describe in cuprates or heavy fermions. So how can a Fermi-surface die continuously? Uh, uh, you know, uh, how can an entire Fermi-surface die continuously? So there's an old idea, going back to Brinkman and Rice, that uh, the way in which it can die continuously is for this jump of the, uh, uh, mom in the momentum distribution, the quasi-particle residue, to vanish continuously. Because in the metal, this jumps, while in the insulator, it's smooth. So to go continuously from here to there, if this jump were to go to zero continuously, then you can imagine that the entire Fermi-Sophus jumps. And there's concrete examples of this in infinite D through DMFT. Uh, but uh, uh, this example is not as nice as I would like it to be, uh, for reasons that I can describe if someone really questions me. Uh, 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 but fortunately, in two or three dimensions, there's other examples that, uh, uh, where we can work things out and where, indeed, uh, the scenario plays itself out uh, 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 in, in a very concrete manner. So the basic question for theory, then, is, uh, OK, uh, z goes to 0 right at this purative mode quantum critical point. Uh, but then what's the nature of the electronic excitations once z has just gone to 0? Uh, uh, you know, there's no quasi-particles left anymore because z is zero. So something else must be going on, right? Uh, so one claim that uh, is uh, uh, fairly easy to justify is that at the critical point, the Fermi surface remains sharply defined even though there is no Landau quasi-particle, okay? So you've lost the quasi-particle, but you've not quite lost the Fermi surface yet, right? So Fermi surface has a ghostly existence right at this critical point, even though it's no land of quasi-particle. That's what I call the critical Fermi surface, uh, thinking about this some years back. And the basic reason is that, as I said, this jump z disappears when you go to the Morton slater. Now, right at the point where it disappears, you expect that instead of a jump, you have some, uh, uh, some other singularity, a kink. Uh, uh, so as you go from, from the Morton slater to the metal, system knows that you're on the verge of developing a jump and the way it knows that is by having a kink in n of k. Right? So by looking at the location of this kink, you still know where the Fermi surface is, uh, even though there's no quasi-particle anymore. OK, uh, so oh, that's how far general thought uh, can take you. To go further, one needs to a theoretical framework uh, to handle this phase transition. And currently, uh, and this is perhaps one of the stumbling blocks in the field, the, but currently, the only th available theoretical framework is through what's known as uh, slave particle gauge theory. Uh, so mean field version of this was developed some years back, and some fluctuation effects in the spin liquid phase were also considered around the same time. Uh, so, so the framework is to split the electron operator into two pieces, right? the boson that carries the charge of the electron and a fermion that just carries its spin. And in the Fermi liquid phase, the Fermi liquid is obtained by condensing this boson. Uh, this is known in the field as slave, slave boson approximation to the Fermi liquid. Well, the Morton slater is obtained by putting this boson into a bosonic Morton slater. And right at the critical point, this boson is critical. And in all these three cases, the fermion forms a Fermi surface. Right? So that's the broad framework. The low energy effective field theory uh, uh, for, a, for this critical, for this period of critical point is obtained by coupling this uh, boson and fermion to fluctuating gauge fields, and these gauge fields come about because this representation is redundant, and you can change the phase of B and F independently at each side. So that's sort of theoretical, so the picture probably useful, and the picture is very simple. Uh, the picture of the metal from high school is that we have ion cores which are stationary, and there are mobile electrons that are swimming around freely. So what is the picture of the Morton slater of the spin liquid that we get near the metal? So the picture is that the charge of the electron gets stuck to these ion cores to neutralize these ions to produce neutral entities 
which are static, but the spin and the Fermi statistics continue to swim around freely. Okay, so that's how we think about the spin liquid Morton's layer. Okay, uh, so it turns out that with this effective field theory, uh, written in terms of weird variables, uh, uh, which is capable of describing both the metal and the insulator, uh, 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 it's possible to analyze fluctuations and come up with a concrete and tractable theory for continuous mode transition and demonstrate this idea that there's a critical Fermi surface at the mode transition. So I don't really have the time to describe many of these results. Uh, uh, let me just go over them. Perhaps the most important experimentally uh, is that we predict that there's a universal jump of the residual resistivity on approaching the insulator from the metal. Okay? There's various other things, in particular, there's a prediction that, uh, this, that, that a marginal Fermi liquid state will emerge near, the, near this quantum critical point uh, on the metallic side. So, so I'll just wind up in a minute or so, and then I'll stop. Uh, so the crossover, uh, you know, it, all of you presumably familiar with the standard quantum critical fan that separates the metal from the insulator. Uh, but for the smooth transition, uh, one can argue, based on this theory, one can show that if you sit right at the critical point, you go into this quantum critical known for a liquid, uh, which we can describe in some detail. But the crossover into the Fermi liquid doesn't occur directly in one step, but rather goes through an intermediate marginal Fermi liquid metal with a Green's function, which looks uh, of the same form as that pr uh, proposed for cuprates by Verma and co-workers uh, 20 years ago, uh, more than 20, 25 years back. Right. So this sort of two-stage crossover happens because the charge fluctuations crossover at one energy scale and the spin fluctuations crossover at a totally different energy scale. Okay. So I'm out of time, so let me stop here. Uh, but let me make uh, one comment about some new work that, uh, 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 that, that I think is really cool. Uh, 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 let me just comment on it, and then you can, uh, uh, I can talk to people later. Uh, you know, in real life, uh, I've been talking about a 2D system, but in real life, uh, we have a layered three-dimensional system. And this poses a really, really fascinating question for this kind of phase transition. Because uh, in the Fermi liquid regime, the interlayer tunneling will be coherent and will get a three-dimensional metal with a warped Fermi surface. Now, in the spin liquid, the spin-ons can't tun tunnel coherently between different layers. So the spin-on tunneling is, gap is blocked. And th so the different layers then dynamically decouple, right? So uh, the in-plane transport for spin-ons will be metallic, but the out-of-plane transport will be insulating, okay? So this leads to this uh, question that in a real layer three-dimensional system, the mode transition is really a dimensionality changing phase transition, where you go from a three-dimensional metal to a dynamically decoupled layer two-dimensional met uh, spin-on metal. Right. So how does such a dimensionality changing transition play itself out? And the answer is that right at the, uh, the critical point, uh, you still have dynamical decoupling between the different layers. So you get a metal that's an electrical conductor for in-plane transport, but it's an electrical insulator for out-of-plane transport. Okay? So it's pretty amazing, uh, but that's exactly how things work out. So let me just uh, summarize. Sorry, I went over time.